I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today, we're continuing with Section 518, Coup d'etat by Edward Lutwak. We're picking up in Chapter 5, The Execution of the Coup d'etat. The Immediate Post-Coup Situation Once our targets have been seized... The Loyalist forces isolated and the rest of the bureaucracy and armed forces neutralized. The active and more mechanical phase of the coup will be over. But everything will still be in the balance. The old regime will have been deprived of its control over the critical parts of the mechanism of the state. But we ourselves will not yet be in control of it, except in a purely physical sense, and then only in the area of the capital city. If we can retain our control over what we have seized... Those political forces whose primary requirement is the preservation of law and order will probably give us their allegiance. Our objective, therefore, is to freeze the situation so that this process can take place. Thus, while the actual execution of the coup, our aim was to destabilize the situation, afterwards all our efforts should be directed at stabilizing, or rather re-stabilizing it. We will be doing this at three different levels. A. Among our own forces where our aim is to prevent our military or police allies from usurping our leadership, b. within the state bureaucracy, whose allegiance and cooperation we wish to secure, and c. with the public at large, whose acceptance we want to gain. In each case, we will be using our leverage within one level in order to control the next one, but each level will also require separate and particular measures. Stabilizing our own forces. During the planning stage, our recruits in the armed forces will be fully conscious of the fact that the success of the coup and their own safety depends on the work of coordination which we perform. Immediately after the coup, however, the only manifestation of all our efforts will be the direct force which they themselves control. In these circumstances, they may well be tempted into trying a coup of their own, and they could do this by establishing contact with the other military leaders we have recruited, so as to secure their agreement to our exclusion from the leadership. Apart from the dispersal countermeasures discussed above, our only effective defense will be to retain full control over all horizontal communications, or in other words, to remain the only contact between each military leader we have recruited and his colleagues. This can sometimes be done technically by keeping under our control the actual communication equipment linking the various units, but this would only be effective in unusually extensive capital cities, and would in any case break down after a relatively short period of time. Usually we will need somewhat less direct political and psychological methods designed to keep apart the various military leaders we've recruited. This may involve promises of accelerated promotion to selected younger officers, who could not otherwise expect very rapid advancement, even within the limited context of those who participate in the coup. It will also be useful to remind our military and police allies that their colleagues outside the conspiracy may try to displace them on block unless they and we form a tight and mutually supporting group. In general... We should ensure that all those who could pose an internal threat are kept occupied on tasks which, whether essential or not, will at least absorb their energies, and that there are decisive factors operating between them. As soon as we begin to receive the allegiance of military and bureaucratic leaders who were previously outside the conspiracy, our leverage with our military and police recruits will increase very substantially. The problem of retaining control against such internal threats will therefore be largely short-term. As soon as our position has been established, our best policy may be to depose of our dangerous allies by using the usual polite methods available for the purpose, diplomatic posting abroad, nominal and or remote command positions, and promotions to less vital part of the state apparatus. Since it's possible that an embryonic coup has existed within our forces from the very beginning, the general security measures we designed to protect ourselves against the penetration of the security agencies will also serve a useful supplementary function. They will prevent the lateral spread of the conspiracy. If our internal security procedures are sufficiently good to prevent all contact between the separate cells so that any infiltration by the security agencies is contained, they will also prevent the coordination of this inner opposition. It has been calculated that in a defensive military situation, even if only 20% of the troops of a unit are loyal, the units concerned should operate successfully and perform their assigned function. And though in aggregate terms our forces will be operating offensively vis-a-vis -vis the uninfiltrated forces of the state, their outlook will be defensive both psychologically and tactically. Thus, even though it would be unusual to have the complete loyalty of those who, since they joined our coup in the first place, must be to some extent inherently disloyal, our forces should still perform successfully. Stabilizing the Bureaucracy 
Our attitude toward the second level, the armed forces and bureaucracy which are not infiltrated before the coup, will depend partly on the degree of control which we have over our own incorporated forces. Assuming that we have a reasonably firm hold over them, we should not try to extract any early commitment from the majority of soldiers and bureaucrats whose first information of our existence will be the coup ex itself. Not knowing the extent of the conspiracy, their principal preoccupation will be the possible danger to their positions in the hierarchy. If most of the officers of the armed forces or the officials of a ministry have joined the coup, those who have not are hardly likely to be rewarded subsequently by rapid promotion. If the soldiers and bureaucrats realize that the group participating in the coup was in reality quite small, they would also realize the strength of their own position, the fact that they are collectively indispensable to any government, including the one to be formed after the coup. In the period immediately after the coup, however, they will probably see themselves as isolated individuals whose careers and even lives could be in danger. This feeling of insecurity may precipitate two alternative reactions, both extreme. They will either step forward to assert their loyalty to the leaders of the coup, or else they will try to foment or join in opposition against us. Both reactions are undesirable from our point of view. Assertions of loyalty will usually be worthless, since they are made by men who have just been abandoned, their previous and possibly more legitimate masters. Opposition will always be dangerous and sometimes disastrous. Our policy towards the military and bureaucratic cadres will be to reduce this sense of insecurity. We should establish direct communication with as many or more senior officers and officials as possible to convey one principal idea in a forceful and convincing manner. That the coup will not threaten their positions in the hierarchy and the aims of the coup do not include a reshaping of the existing military or administrative structures. This requirement will incidentally have technical implications in the planning stage when the sabotage of the means of communication must be carried out so as to be easily reversible. The information campaign over the mass media will also reach this narrow but important section of the population, but it would be highly desirable to have more direct and confidential means of communication with them. The general political aims of the coup, as expressed in our pronouncements on the radio and television, will help to package our tacit deal with the bureaucrats and soldiers, but its real content will be the assurance that their careers are not threatened. In dealing with particular army or police officers who control especially important forces or with important bureaucrats, we may well decide to go further in the sense that an actual exchange of promises of mutual support may take place. We should, however, remember that our main strength lies in the fact that only we have a precise idea of the extent of our power. It would therefore be unwise to enter into agreements which indicate that we need support urgently. More generally, any information which reveals the limits of our capabilities could threaten our position, which is essentially based on the fact that our inherent weakness is concealed. Again, as in the case of our incorporated forces, we should make every effort to prevent communication between the cadres of the armed forces and bureaucracy outside our group. Such communication would usually be indispensable to those who may seek to stage a counter coup. The ignorance of the extent of the conspiracy will discourage such consultations. It is obviously dangerous to ask somebody to participate in the opposition to a group of which he is himself a member. But we should also interfere with such consultations directly by using our control of the transport and communications infrastructure. From power to authority, stabilizing the masses. The masses have neither the weapons of the military nor the administrative facilities of the bureaucracy. But their attitude to the new government established after the coup will ultimately be decisive. Our immediate aim will be to enforce public order, but our long-term objective is to gain the acceptance of the masses so that physical coercion will no longer be needed in order to secure compliance with our orders. In both phases, we shall use our control over the infrastructure and the means of coercion. But as the coup recedes in time, political means will become increasingly important, physical ones less so. Our first measures to be taken immediately after the active phase of the coup will be designed to freeze the situation by imposing physical immobility. A total curfew, the interruption of all forms of public transport, the closing of all public buildings and facilities, and the interruption of the telecommunication services will prevent, or at any rate impede, active resistance to us. Organized resistance will be very difficult since there will be no way of inspiring and coordinating our potential opponents. Unorganized resistance on the part of the mob will, on the other hand, be prevented because the people who might form such a mob would have to violate the curfew while acting as individuals, and not many will do this without the protective shelter of anonymity which a crowd provides. The impact of our physical measures will be reduced outside the capital city, but to the extent that the capital city is the focus of the national network of transport and communications, 
both physical movement and the flow of information will be impeded. The physical controls will be purely negative and defensive in character, and our reliance on them could be minimal because their concomitant effect is to enhance the importance of the armed forces we have subverted. Our second and far more flexible instrument will be our control over the means of mass communications. Their importance will be particularly great because the flow of all other information will be affected by our physical controls. Moreover, the confused and dramatic events of the coup will mean that the radio and television services will have a particularly attentive and receptive audience. In broadcasting over the radio and television services, our purpose is not to provide information about the situation, but rather to affect its development by exploiting our monopoly of these media. We will have two principal objectives in the information campaign that will start immediately after the coup. A. To discourage resistance to us by emphasizing the strength of our position. And B. To dampen the fears which would otherwise give rise to such resistance. Now, there's a table here. It says Table 15, the first communique, a choice of styles. The Romantic Lyrical. This is not a communique, but an avowal, an undertaking, and an appeal. It's an avowal of the situation in which the army and the people have been reduced by a handful of evil men. It's an undertaking to wash clean the shame and disgrace suffered by the army. It's finally a call to arms and to honor. That was made by Captain Mustafa Hamdoun, Aleppo Radio, 6.30 a.m., 25th of February, 1954. Next is the Messianic. The bourgeoisie is abolished. A new era of equality between all citizens is inaugurated. All agreements with foreign countries will be respected. That was made by Colonel Jean Bedel Bokassa, Central African Republic, 15th of January, 1966. Next is the unprepared. This rebellion has been made for a strong, united, and prosperous Nigeria, free from corruption and internal strife, looting, arson, homosexuality, rape, embezzlement, bribery, corruption, sabotage, and false alarm will be punishable by death. That was made by Major Zagou, Radio Kaduna, Nigeria, 15th of January, 1966. Finally, there is the rational administrative. The myth surrounding Kwame Nkrumah has been broken. He ruled the country as if it were his private property. His capricious handling of the country's economic affairs brought the country to the point of economic collapse. We hope to announce measures for curing the country's troubles within a few days. The future definitely bright. Radio Communique of Ghana's National Liberation Council, February 1966. Moving on. Our first objective will be achieved by conveying the reality and strength of the coup, instead of trying to justify it. This will be done by listing the controls we have imposed, by emphasizing that law and order have been fully restored, and by stating that all resistance has ceased. One of the major obstacles to active resistance will be the fact that we have fragmented the opposition, so that each individual opponent would have to operate in isolation, cut off from friends and associates. In these circumstances, the news of any resistance against us would act as a powerful stimulant to further resistance by breaking down this feeling of isolation. We must therefore make every effort to withhold such news. If there is in fact some resistance, and if its intensity and locale are such to make it difficult to conceal from particular segments of the public, we should admit its existence. But we should strongly emphasize that it is isolated, the product of the obstinacy of a few misguided or dishonest individuals who are not affiliated to any party or group of significant membership. The constant working of the motif of isolation, the repetition of long and detailed lists of the administrative and physical controls we have imposed, and the emphasis on the fact that law and order have been reestablished, should have the same effect of making resistance appear as dangerous and useless. The second objective of our information campaign will be to reassure the general public by dispelling fears that the coup is inspired by foreign and or extremist elements, and to persuade particular groups that the coup is not a threat to them. The first aim will be achieved by manipulating national symbols and by asserting our belief in the prevailing pieties. In the Arab world, the new regime will announce its belief in Arab unity and Islam, or Arab unity and socialism, as the case may be. Whereas, in Egypt, the revolution has been institutionalized, it will now be necessary to assert our belief in al thawra in Africa, the new regime will announce its intention of fighting tribalism at home and racialism abroad. In Latin America, the need to secure social justice or to fight communism and perhaps fidelismo will be invoked. Everywhere in the third world, nationalist rhetoric will be used and references made to the glorious people of X and the glorious land of X, which the last regime is degraded. Above all, repeated denunciations of neo and not-so-neo-colonialism are de rigueur. 
Such denunciations will be particularly important where there is a large foreign business enterprise operating in the country in question. The inevitable suspicions that the coup is a product of the machinations of the company can only be dispelled by making violent attacks on it. These being verbal and not unexpected, will pacify the public without disturbing the business interests, and the attack should be all the more violent if these suspicions are in fact justified. While the religious attitude leads to the praise of the gods for one's successes and self-blame for one's failures, the nationalist attitude is to attribute successes to the nation and to blame foreigners for its failures. Similarly, the chants and praise of the gods have been replaced by ritualized curses variously addressed to different groups of foreigners and their activities. Thus, for the phrase... The imperialist neo-colonialist power block. Read the English and the French, if it is spoken by Africans of former colonies of those countries, while the phrase Zionist oil monopolist plotters translates into Jews and Christians in the subconscious of the Muslim Arabs who make use of it. There may be a purely ideological element in these denunciations, but even when the American extreme right speaks of the international conspiracy of godless communism, it is significant that they stigmatize it as un-American rather than as anti-capitalist. We shall make use of the suitable selection of these lovely f phrases. Though their meaning has been totally obscured by constant and deliberate misuse, they will be useful as indicators of our impeccable nationalism. And if that is not in reality, our position, they will serve to obscure our true policy aims. The flow of information emanating from all the sources under our control should be coordinated with our other measures. The impositions of physical controls will be announced and explained, and the political moves to which we now turn will be suitably presented. Physical coercion will deter or defeat direct opposition, while the information campaign will lay the basis of our eventual acquisition of authority, but only political means will secure for us a base of active support. Where the pre-coup regime was exceptionally brutal, corrupt, or retrograde, the leaders of the coup will have little trouble in gaining a generalized form of acceptance, but even then, the active support of specific groups can only be gained by political accommodation, i.e. by sponsoring policies, which serve the interests of particular groups, thus giving them reasons for becoming committed to, or at least interested in, our survival. In some Latin American countries, for example, we could gain the support of the landless peasants by announcing our intention of carrying out a program of agrarian reform. In West Africa, we can announce our intention of increasing the prices paid to peasant producers by the various commodity marketing boards. In Greece and Turkey, where there is a heavy burden of peasant indebtedness, we can announce a general cancellation of agrarian debts. Each of these policy announcements will bind the interests of a large and politically powerful group to our government, unless we are overtaken by other rival announcements, but it will also lead to the hostility of other groups whose interests are damaged by our intended policies. In Latin America, where the peasants would benefit, the landlords would lose. In Africa, the urban population would be the loser, while in Greece, the taxpayer would bear the burden of peasant debt relief. Thus, the backing of one interest group will generally have as its concomitant the loss of support of or even actual hostility from other groups. Clearly, it will be necessary to estimate the net political support which a given policy announcement will generate. This will mean taking into account not only the political significance of each group, but also the immediacy of its political power. In the context of a Latin American post-coup situation, for example, the goodwill of remote and dispersed peasants will not help us much against the immediate and powerful opposition of bureaucratic and military cadres, who could for the most part be the children of the landowning aristocracy. If, on the other hand, our short-term position is strong, but we are threatened by a longer-term usurpation of power on the part of the military allies, our objective will be to create a counterweight, capable eventually of becoming a source of direct strength, such as a peasant's militia. Thus, whether we opt for a left policy of land reform and longer-term campesino support, or a right policy of peasant repression and immediate landowner support, will depend on the balance between the strength of our short and long-term positions. The almost mechanical elements which are important in the special climate of the immediate post-coup period will distort the normal balance between our political forces of the country concern. If, therefore, our short-term position is not fragile, we should repress the agitation of those forces which have a disproportionate strength in the short term and concentrate instead on cultivating the support of those groups whose longer term strength is the greater. An element in our strategy after the coup is halfway between the information and the political campaign. The problem of legitimizing the coup. Clearly the coup is by definition illegal, but whether this illegality matters and whether it is possible to counteract its effects will depend on the total political environment of the country in question. We've seen in Chapter 2 that much of the Third World, the legitimacy or otherwise of the government, will not greatly matter. The government is treated as part of nature, that is, something one adjusts to rather than questions. Elsewhere, however, the general attitude of the masses could be more legalistic. 
One way of legitimizing the post-coup government has already been mentioned in the discussion of the selection of the personalities to be arrested. The retention of the nominal head of state, where such a constitutional role exists, as our own highly nominal head of state. In this way, the appearance of continuity will be attained and with it the appearance of legitimacy. Where the head of state is not nominal, as in presidential regimes, other tactics will have to be used. The announcement of forthcoming elections, or a referendum, as a sort of ex post facto legitimization, or alternatively, the coup can be openly admitted as an extra-constitutional invention, but one made against an unconstitutional regime. One illegality will then be represented as being the cause of the other. But we shall declare that whereas the illegality of the pre-coup regime was voluntary and permanent, ours is necessary and temporary. Such techniques will be of limited value in conducting the political processes required to create a base of active support and to secure our authority, since everything will depend on the particular political environment in which we will be operating. One particular problem, however, requires further exploration. Recognition by foreign powers. This is almost always important, but for many countries of the third world whose pays real lies outside their own borders, it will be a crucial problem. When much of the available disposable funds come from foreign loans, investments, or grants, and when foreign cadres carry out vital administrative, technical, and sometimes even military functions, the maintenance of good relations with the particular donor country or countries concerned may well be a determining factor in our political survival after the coup. Premature recognition by a foreign power, i.e. recognition granted while the old regime still retains some degree of control, is becoming regarded as a form of aggression in international law. Beyond this, however, recognition is usually granted to illegitimate governments after a polite interval if there are convincing assurances about the continuity in terms of foreign relations. These assurances are conveyed simply and publicly by formal announcements stating that membership in alliances and groupings will be maintained, that foreign agreements and obligations will be respected, and that legitimate foreign operations in the country concerned will not be harmed. Thus, the leaders of Ghana's National Liberation Council, which was formed after Nakruma's overthrow, announced that Ghana would retain her membership of the Commonwealth, the Organization of African Unity, and of the UN, and would respect all obligations undertaken by Nakruma's regime. Similarly, Arab post-coup regimes announced that they will remain in the Arab League, and Latin American regimes in the Organization of American States. Far more important than these declarations is the considerable diplomacy activity which will take place after the coup, and sometimes even before it. The purpose of these diplomatic exchanges will be to clarify the political situation and nowadays to indicate or dissemble the ideological orientation of the planners of the coup. Most countries of the world follow British diplomatic doctrine in granting recognition to regimes on the basis of effective control of their territories. But this is a doctrine as flexible as the definition of control, so that recognition can sometimes be withheld if the pre-coup regime retains control over some part of the national territory, as in the case of British non-recognition of the Yemeni Republican regime. After the necessary exchanges of information and assurances, the new government will usually be recognized. This will be so even if the illegality is an embarrassment, as in the case of the United States and Latin American coups, or if its ideological orientation is distasteful, as in the case of the Soviet Union and the Ghanaian and Indonesian coups. Diplomatic recognition is one of the elements in the general process of establishing the authority of the new government. Until this is achieved, we will have to rely on the brittle instruments of physical coercion, and our position will be vulnerable to many threats, including that of coup d'etat. Thus concludes section 518 of Coup d'etat by Edward Lutwak. Thus concludes chapter 5, the execution of the coup d'etat. Tomorrow we'll continue with section 519, appendix A, the economics of repression. I will see you then. Olam.